Matthew chapter 5 is where we are. Matthew chapter 5, join me there. <clears throat> if you have uh, not been with us in our study on the book of Matthew, let me, uh, me kind of get you up to date a little bit if I could. Let me zoom out for just a second, give us a little bit of context on the book, and then we'll zoom into the passage that we're in today. I want to do that periodically so we get a picture of context. Words have meaning in their context, right? So in Matthew chapter 1 and 2, we see the ancestry and the nativity of Jesus. In chapter 3, we see the forerunner, the herald, John the Baptist, as he comes to make straight the path for the Messiah. In chapter 4, it is the temptation of Christ in the wilderness and the calling of his first disciples. So in, in those four verses, four chapters, you have the first 30 years of Jesus' life. And the, the 3,000 years of history leading up to his life. And then in chapters 5, 6, and 7, the next three chapters, those all take place on one occasion. It's one time Jesus is speaking, and it's a sermon that Matthew has recorded for us. So it tells you that Matthew, the gospel writer, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, valued what Jesus said. Thought that was important. A lot of red letters in the book of Matthew. And so as we've started this Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5, we've gone through the Beatitudes. These eight sayings or principles, it's like a principle with a promise. If, you, if you're this way, you'll be blessed because of this. God will act this way if you're that way. And it's not um, ways for a person to be saved. It's not uh, ways for you to even uh, live a good life, a good moral life. That's really not what the Sermon on the Mount is about. I've told you this as we've gone uh, through it these last three weeks. These are kingdom attributes. If you are a citizen of God's kingdom, this is how you'll be. And so as we, we look into the Sermon on the Mount, often it's, it's like, oh, there's tough words in the Sermon on the Mount. It's like one of those mirrors with a really bright light. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, you see all the little imperfections. But this is how we should be, how we should be acting. This is a standard, the gold standard, if you will. So with that in mind, let me remind you of last uh, week is verse 10 through 12. It was about Christian persecution. It says, blessed are those who are persecuted and, and blessed are you when they falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Be glad and rejoice, he says. So he says, if you, if you live for me, people are going to say bad things about you. If you stick out, you're going to get uh, persecuted. If you're the nail that sticks out, the world will hammer you. And that's true. And then this week, after having just said that, in verses 13 through 16, which we'll look at this morning, he's going to essentially tell us, stick out. Stick out. That's what he's going to say. Let's read it this morning. It says this in verse 13. It'll probably be familiar to you. It says this, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but, but rather on a lampstand. And it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. It says two things. You are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. So as we think about that this morning, we've got to clear up something for us. When it says salt, we have a different understanding of salt than they had in the ancient world. When you think about salt, uh, you, you probably think about uh, something like this. You think about table salt. You think about something you sprinkle on your food. You might think about that guy. Have you seen that guy on the Internet, the salt bay? You know, he cuts up the steak, and then he goes like that and sprinkles, and it, and it dribbles down. Have you all seen that? Anybody? Only one? A couple of you all on Instagram? Cool, thanks. All by myself up here. I wonder, does he, does he, does he sanitize his elbow? I don't know, that just seemed kind of weird. It just bounces off. I don't know where that elbow's been. Don't want it in my food. But anyways, we think about this kind of salt. And the truth is, most of us eat too much of this kind of salt. We think of this as a bad thing. We're trying to avoid this if we can. 
The American Heart Association says that most Americans eat too much salt, and we should avoid it. But did you know that salt in the ancient world was one of the most valuable minerals on earth? It's been said that more wars have been fought over salt than any other mineral, including gold. Can you imagine that? People fighting wars. And, and you know what they use in those wars? Assault weapons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I was waiting for that one. Whew. Those soldiers are seasoned veterans. <laughs> oh. Yes. You know, at one time in the Roman world, Roman soldiers were paid in salt because it was so valuable. As a matter of fact, in Latin, the word salarium would be like a per diem for a, a soldier to buy salt or being paid in salt. And that's where we get our English word salary. Salary comes from that understanding. Also, that's where we get the phrase like a person is not worth his salt. That comes from a time when people got paid uh, in salt. As a matter of fact, in America, a war, uh, a battle at least, was fought, fought for salt in the uh, Civil War in, on October 2nd, 1864 at Saltville, Virginia. Uh, a battle was fought. Uh, 2,500 Confederate soldiers squared off against 8,000 Union soldiers. Now, why would 2,500 soldiers fight 8,000 uh, soldiers? It's because that was the location of the salt works and salt mines primarily for the Confederacy. And they had to defend it. They did so for a little while. A couple of months later, the Union soldiers just uh, wore them out and eventually tore up the salt mine and, and, and their ability to produce salt. The Confederates had to have that salt, though, to preserve meat for their soldiers and, and also to tan leather for boots. And eventually, only a short time later, after that salt mine is destroyed and their ability to produce salt is, is rendered useless, the Confederacy surrendered pretty soon after that. So Jesus tells us, you know, with that ancient uh, understanding of how beneficial and how valuable salt was, with that understanding, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You know, salt has a lot of functions. We saw one this week. You probably sprinkled some out on your sidewalks maybe to, to melt the ice. That's one function of salt. Isn't it interesting? Salt makes ice melt at a colder temperature, but it also, uh, when added to water, makes the boiling point of water higher. Isn't that interesting? Kind of a contrast there. As a matter of fact, the modern salt industry boasts 14,000 different uses for salt. I'm going to read those for you right now. Just kidding. Some of y'all don't fall for that anymore. But for us, you know, in, in our minds, modern uh, use of salt, we primarily think about for taste, for seasoning our food. Uh, you know, my family <laughs> grew up, or I grew up, and my family has a history of heart disease. As a matter of fact, we jokingly say that our family is the history of heart disease because it's so bad. And so we, we didn't really eat salt in my home growing up. Not true in Alyssa's home. She grew up in her family. They used salt and put a lot of salt in things. So she really introduced me to salt. Like, for example, we, and I was a kid, we put butter on corn on the cob. They put butter and salt. Makes it way better, right? <laughs> like somebody told me to put salt on watermelon one time. I thought, you are disgusting. I will not. And I tried it. It's incredible. What, what, how does it work? I don't know. We think about taste probably primarily for us. In the ancient world, though, the reason why salt was so valuable wasn't for flavor. It was because salt is a preservative. They didn't have refrigeration, deep freezes, that kind of thing. And salt, when added to meat, displaces the moisture. And so bacteria can't grow. And food can be preserved for a long time in salt. And I think that's the primary way in which Jesus means that we ought to be the salt of the earth. That carries with it a presupposition. And that is this, the world is rotting. It is decaying because of sin. And usually nobody wants to argue that with me. And if anybody does, I tell them, just watch the news. We see things happening in our world, and it seems like they go from bad to worse. Our world is rotting and decaying. Moral filth 
is rampant and abundant, how will it be preserved? Well, God has his preserving agent in the world to function as a preservative, to hold off raw and moral decay. That is the job of the follower of Jesus. That is the Christian's job. But often, we are not so good about our job. Let me give you an illustration. If you go home this afternoon and start rummaging around the refrigerator to find something to eat, and you open those doors or that door, however, whatever kind of refrigerator you have, and and a pungent aroma comes out of your refrigerator, and no cold air comes out, and you realize that in the middle of the night, your refrigerator's gone out, and the meat that you had in there to thaw for lunch or dinner tonight, has turned rotten. Will you get mad at the meat or the fridge? See, we complain a lot about the meat. We complain about how wicked and sinful the world is. But the world is rotting and decaying because of sin. But there's a preserving agent in the world. That's us. It's not our job to complain about the World, it's our job to preserve the world, to hold off the decay that comes with sin. It's not our job to complain about it, it's our job to fix it. Our job as Christians here on earth, our primary function is to be a preserving agent. You, you think about the ancient world. You think about how brutal it was. We think we read stories in the Old Testament. And, so, and honestly, for us, it's like R-rated stuff a lot of times. The violence and things that you see happening there is not the case in the world that we live in. Our world has been shaped by and structured by and influenced by and preserved by the Word of God. When we see it decline away from the Word of God. We see the increase in immorality. It's our job to hold it back. And you know, as bad as the world is today, can you imagine a world completely void of Christian influence? Be terrible. As, as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that world is coming. It's what we studied in the book of Revelation called the tribulation period. When all of God's people are raptured to heaven, there'll be a seven-year tribulation period where literally hell is let loose on earth. All Christian influence will be taken away. And it's described as the worst time to ever live on planet Earth. Planet Earth has been through some rough times. So that's saying a lot. This is our job to preserve this world, to hold off the effects and the influence of sin. And let me just tell you this. This is what Christians do. There's a, there's a, a, a belief, a narrative that's out there in, in popular culture that Christianity just holds people back, that we repress people's freedoms, that if we just let loose and let people go, they would really find true happiness. And true happiness is found out there in different kinds of freedom from different kinds of oppression that religion puts on it. But let me give you some statistics this morning. And this is a a pastor that I follow on Instagram, uh, posted these this week. I thought they were really relevant. Do you know evangelical Christians adopt more children than any other segment of society. And it's twice the norm, or than double the norm. Christians provide a lot of good for this world. Here's one that might get your attention. Uh, in, in the category of people who answered yes, that they're, they are satisfied in their sexual relationship with their partners, Christians fall into that category. So by that standard, Christians are the most satisfied uh, sexually in their sexual relationships with their spouses. And and that's important. Uh, I point that out because, you know, when I say stuff like that, every eye looks up at me. But also because the world is telling you, and friends, especially my young people back there, the world is telling you if you have enough sex with enough people, then you'll be happy. But statistically, that's not true. You want satisfaction, this is what you need. Just fill up your plate with all kinds of perversions and that'll make you happy. But statistically, that's not true. It's the people who are in biblical relationships sexually that are most satisfied statistically. So isn't that interesting? Also, do you know that regular church attendance 
dramatically improves your mental health. And of those surveyed uh, from 2020, the only group whose mental health improved in the year of 2020 were regular church attenders. Isn't that interesting? You know, uh, Christians are statistically more generous to charities with their time and money. Well, that makes sense. You know that when, in a, when a, a given community has a higher uh, statistic of church attendance, a higher number of people who are in church regularly, then they, that community also has a lower rate of burglary, larceny, robbery, assault, and homicide. We, we have an influence. We, we have an impact. Christians and the church are good for the world. We are preserving it. You know, for adolescents, regular church attendance helps decrease the big three dangers. That's what they call them, the big three dangers of adolescence, which is depression, substance abuse, and sexual promiscuity. That, way, that is to say, adolescents, if you are regularly in church, you're less likely to suffer from depression, substance abuse, and be tied up in sexual promiscuity. You know, Christians who are conservative Christians who attend church regularly are 35% less likely to get divorced. We have an influence on the world around us. The gospel makes a difference on people's lives. So when, so when you share the gospel with somebody, you're not giving them a list of rules that they have to add to their life that's going to take away their joy and take away their freedom. You are giving them joy. You're giving them freedom. You're giving them hope. You're making their life better. It's the only hope, friends. It's the only hope. The church of Jesus Christ, this church, locally, and all save people who make up the church globally, the body of Christ, listen, are the only hope for this world. Jesus is the only hope. And we are his ambassadors. We are his chosen route to get his good news to the whole world. God could have chose a lot of ways to do that. But he didn't. He chose one way, and that's you and me as followers of Jesus. We are his only way to get the gospel out to the whole world. He could have done a Super Bowl commercial. He could have done a, you know, a leaflet campaign or something like that. Social media ad. He could have done a lot of things to get the gospel out. But Jesus' chosen method is to leave you here on earth after you're saved to spread the gospel. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if, you know, like we got saved, we got baptized, and then boom, off to heaven. Be cool. I don't know who would baptize you. There'd be some details we'd have to work out in there, I guess, but you just dunk yourself, right? Self-dunk. I don't know. But God doesn't do it that way for a reason. He's got a job for you. You're saved sanctified to serve. God's got work he wants you to do. He cares about this world, and that's why he's put you here. And the church, his church, his people are the only hope of mankind. Listen, uh, PTA is a good thing, but it, it won't save the world. Uh, your ball team, it's a good thing, but it won't save the world. Your hobbies, depending on what they are, are a good thing, but they won't save the world. Your politics politicians, your political structures and political institutions and how much we love those, how passionate we are about those things, politics will never save the world. Only Jesus. And we are his ambassadors. That's it, the church. The church. And that's what he says. Salt of the earth, light of the world. The earth, the world. That's our area of influence, our sphere of influence. Supposed to be out in the, earth, in the world, out among the people. That's why isolationism, uh, communes, monasteries, those kind of things, hiding away from society, that might help steer us clear from temptation in some ways. But we surrender our purpose when we do that. We're supposed to be salt of the earth. And do you notice it doesn't say salt of the church? <clears throat> some Christians are really good at looking like salt at church. When you're around other salty people, you act salty. 
But when you're around the worldly people, you act like the other kind of salty. You know what I mean? We act like the world. But we do know the world no good when we act like the world around the world. We ought to act like salt in the world. That's the only way. And he asks this question. He says, if the salt loses its taste or saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Well, so let me just tell you that, you know, scientifically, that's actually impossible for salt to lose its saltiness. If it's salt, it's salty. That's just how it is. But what happens sometimes with salt, and if you think about this, it makes sense. If you are selling salt or profiting off of salt, and salt's a valuable commodity, it'd be in your best interest to add in cheap fillers to make it look like you got more salt to sell when you don't. And as a matter of fact, the Dead Sea uh, here uh, near uh, Israel was a salty sea, but you couldn't use the salt because that salt was contaminated by another mineral called gypsum. And so salt never loses its saltiness, but it becomes contaminated with other minerals and other things, and it's rendered ineffective. And so what do you do with salt that's no longer salty? What do you do with salt that's contaminated? Well, don't go throw it in the garden, right? Don't put it on your crops. Don't put it on your front yard. Because it just kills everything that you, you put it on. You put it on the road because you don't want grass to grow on the road anyways. And people will walk on it and break it down, and it'll break down back into the soil eventually. That's all it's good for. It's worthless. Well, how do Christians lose their saltiness? Well, if you're saved... If you're a follower of Jesus, you never lose that. If you were ever saved, you're still saved. It's important. Christians don't lose their salvation. That's never happened once. Jesus' track record is pretty good when it comes to keeping his people saved. But our influence, our effectiveness in the world can be rendered ineffective when it's contaminated. It's watered down. And so here's, here's a, another way to say that. Your words won't matter if your life ain't clean. Your words won't matter if your life ain't clean. Now, I didn't say perfect. Nobody's perfect. Nobody on stage that you've seen today is perfect. Nobody in the chairs, the people around you is perfect. Like, look at your neighbor and say, you ain't perfect. Thank you, both of you, for doing that. Right? Nobody's perfect. We're not talking about that. But we're talking about your, your lifestyle matching the words you proclaim. Like, 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 uh, like let me give you this illustration. <clears throat> you, know, you know what it takes to lose weight? Like, if you want to lose weight, you know, that, that's a goal you have. You know what it takes? Two things, right? Diet. What's the other one? Exercise. That's right. Diet. Exercise. Like, that's simple. Everybody knows that, right? Did I teach anybody anything this morning? Uh Uh-uh. And yet there's a multi-billion dollar weight loss industry in America. Why is that? Every kind of diet, every diet thinks they're the best. Every kind of uh, exercise plan you can do. And the best thing are the exercise gadgets that people come up with. It's incredible. We all know. Uh, Athletes will often say that you can't uh, work out and, and overcome a bad uh, intake of food, your diet. You can't overcome a bad diet. And if you, you restrict your calories, you got to burn off the ones you get, so you got to have it. It takes both, right? It takes both things. We all know that. The same thing is true with the Christian life. If you live like the world, but you're telling the world about Jesus, the world will just look at your life and say, look, it hasn't made an impact in your life. Why would I want what you have? And conversely, if, if you... If you are living the Christian life, people will just think you're a nice guy, a good person, unless you speak up and tell them the reason why you live different. It takes both. So you become contaminated by sin. Your life becomes contaminated. It can be rendered ineffective. Once again, I'm not saying you got to be perfect. Nobody's perfect. There's a difference between struggling with sin and not struggling with sin when you ought to be struggling when you ought to be dealing with it, repenting of it, and moving forward. Also, uh, oftentimes as Christians, we become watered down. This is something we've seen 
uh, throughout history, you know, a lot of times for the sake of relevance, Christians or churches will try to take the sting out of the gospel. Isn't that interesting, by the way, salt? You put salt, like rubbing salt in a wound. We have a saying for that, right? It hurts, doesn't it? But, but the reason why that's a saying is because salt was used as an antiseptic for a long time. The same reason why it preserves meat, it helps keep uh, from getting infection, infections in wounds. But Christian, we try to take the sting out of the gospel. If you're going to tell people about Jesus, the good news of the gospel, there's always going to be a sting. I mean, just, just like if you're in the darkness and somebody flips on the light, it's always going to burn. There's always going to, you're going to have to confront people when you tell them about Jesus. To tell somebody they're a sinner in a nice way. How do you do that? How do you tell somebody a sinner without offending them a little bit? you got to say the way you are is not the way you ought to be, but Jesus came and died for the things that you and I have done. That has to come across to tell people about Jesus, to tell people the good news. But sometimes we think, well, maybe if we can make, the, if we can make Christianity look enough like the world, then the world will want to become Christians. But what always happens is you end up converting Christianity to the world, not the world to Christianity. For the sake of relevance, we become irrelevant when we, when we let loose the standard of God that he's given us in his word. So it's no longer if anything you throw it out, uh, throw it out and, and let it be trampled by men. In verse 14 he says this, the light. So he told us about to be salt. Now he says, you are the light of the world. And he gives two illustrations. A city situated on a hill can't be hidden. And no one lights a lamp and put it, puts it under a basket. So I think, I thought about this, this is kind of weird. I thought about this from God's perspective this week. You know, if, if, the, if people all around us are in the darkness and we shine, you know, like from God's perspective, he knows who's his and who's not his. They stick out. So from his perspective, imagine if we then put a, a basket over our heads to conceal the shine, conceal the light. How foolish would that be? That's what a Christian looks like to God when they just try to blend in with the darkness instead of shining the light. Another presupposition, the world is dark. The world is dark. The world is full of darkness. And we're told to be the light. The reason why is because God is the light. You know, in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 5, it says that God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Uh, and by the way, in the Greek, that's a double negative. It doesn't come across in the English because that's permissible in the Greek and not in the English. But that's like saying, God ain't got no darkness. It's emphatic when you say it that way. Tim, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16 says that God who alone is immortal and invisible and lives in unapproachable light. That's God. Throughout the, the Bible, God is pictured as light. So if, if we are his followers, then we ought to shine too, right? And, and what we ought to do is be like the moon, not like the sun. Okay, the moon itself produces no light. The moon only reflects the light of the sun. The source is not the moon. The source is the sun. We ought to reflect his light, right? So you know, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. <clears throat> All right, pardon me. You know that song, right? Here's the truth. Our light is his light. You know, we don't produce our own light. We just reflect his light in others. And so let me give you a couple of excuses why you should not shine your light. This is Christian's excuses not to shine the light. They'll say, well, first of all, my light is too small and too insignificant. Well, here's the good news. It's not your light. It's God's light. And by the way, you know, uh, that's a subjective co uh, uh, comment, right? I mean, light is only as bright as compared to the darkness it's in. So, for example, like my watch lights up. Can you all see that? No, you can't because I got stage lights shining on me, right? Spotlights. But I guarantee you if this room was completely pitch black dark and I just illuminated my watch right here, it would provide enough light for you to see me from across the room. Or, or how about your cell phone, right? So you light up your cell phone. That's not very bright unless you're in a movie theater and some yahoo behind you has their phone all lit up and you see the light glowing and shining. See, light is only bright compared to the darkness. Well, the world is really dark. So any light, any amount of light is impactful and noticeable. As a matter of fact, if you were to take all the darkness in the whole world and put it in one room, 
you could do that. All the darkness from every shadow and dark place in the whole world and light one match, you'd still be able to see that match. See, no darkness can overcome light. Light always overcomes darkness. Light always has an impact on darkness. That's true in the physical world, and that's true in the spiritual world as well. My light is too small. Well, it's not your light, and it just depends on how much the darkness is. How about this? My past, I hear people say that a lot. Well, I can't live for Jesus now because those people know how I used to be. I can't tell you the gospel because they know how I used to live. Listen, Jesus takes dirty instruments and cleans them up and puts them to work. I heard, a, I heard a preacher say one time, if you think about a surgeon, you know, a surgeon, if you go into an operating room, they have all these different gadgets all over the place that are twisted and funny looking. They have a specific purpose for each one of those things. And a surgeon can use all of these instruments, but there's only one kind of instrument he can't use, and that's a dirty instrument. Well, th- that's true, but here's what Jesus does, unlike the surgeon. Jesus takes dirty instruments and cleans them up and then puts them to work. And uses them for the delicate work of sharing the gospel with people. And here's why. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that, this is important, this is what the purpose is, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So the purpose is not that people look at you. The purpose is that people look to God. They see the difference that he's made in your life, and he gets the credit, he gets the glory, not you. Somebody told me this one time, I heard a preacher in seminary preach that oftentimes we want to put Christians in the spotlight. But Christians aren't supposed to be in the spotlight. Christians are supposed to be the spotlight. We're, that's what he says, you are the light. We are the light, and our light should be shining towards heaven, pointing people that way. Are you shining your light today, friends? Are you shining your light? Are you the salt of the earth? Are you living for Jesus? Does your life look like Jesus? Are you using the influence that God has given you for kingdom purpose so that he gets the glory? That's the question this morning. That's the takeaway. That's the challenge, if you will. But let me tell you this, friends. It's an everyday thing. Living for Jesus is an everyday thing. But not everybody wants that, that everyday Jesus. A lot of people want that once a week Jesus. Once a month, Jesus, that annual Jesus or biannual Jesus, you know, Christmas and Easter. But living for Jesus is not a thing you do on Sundays. It's not a thing you do once a year at holidays. It's a thing you do every single day. You influence those people around you for the sake of the gospel every single day. Are you all in for that purpose? I mean, think about the influence God has given you. The people in your life, are you influencing all of those people to the best of your ability for the gospel? Think about it for a moment. That's the challenge today. Let me give you the invitation. Listen, Jesus says if the salt loses its saltiness, it can't be made salt again. So if either you're salt or you're not. You're either a citizen of the kingdom, and so therefore in your life, increasingly you're seeing the kingdom attributes grow and increase that are exemplified in the Sermon on the Mount. Or you're not a citizen. If God's not a priority in your life, doing his will and his work is not a priority in your life, his word, his people, these aren't priorities in your life, then it's very likely that you are not a kingdom citizen. Not a citizen of the kingdom. You can't be salt if you ain't salt. Has there been a moment in your life when you became a follower of Jesus? A moment when you became salty. You became the light on this earth. Some of you might look back at a time like, oh, man, I remember this time. Right after I got saved, man, I was inviting all my friends to church. Huh? And I was telling people about Jesus. I didn't care who saw. I had my Bible out on my desk at work or at school. I didn't care who saw. But man, I don't know. I kind of cooled off. Listen, the challenge today is be salty again. The world needs you. Be light again. It's dark out there. You're their only hope. But maybe you've, you've never come to Christ. And we've been talking this morning about how Christians are supposed to act. Let me just take a second and say this. 
I know a lot of people who tell me, I've heard them say, they're not Christians. They don't want to give their life to Christ because of the way Christians act. Because Christians don't always act like this. They'll say, you know, there's a lot of hypocrites in that church, Pastor. And listen, and that may be true, but let me tell you this, friend. Jesus is no hypocrite. You know that? Jesus is no hypocrite. So I'm not saying come to the people. I'm saying come to Jesus. Here's the thing that's true. You know, you take more and more salt. Sometimes all, you get enough salt. It's a little too salty in your mouth, right? But not with Jesus. Jesus just gets sweeter and sweeter with time. Come to him today. Become the hope for humanity. Come and become that preserving agent here on earth. Would you bow your heads for a moment this morning and close your eyes all around the room? Would you just take a second this morning and evaluate and just to make sure? Let me ask you again. Has there been a moment in your life where you began to live your life for Christ? Maybe you're, you're a brand new believer and you said, man, I, I, I just I, I haven't quite gotten there yet. That's great. I'm so glad you're saved. And you're growing towards that effort. But maybe you've, you're here and you've been here. And you've been here a long time. You've been in church a long time. But there's never really been a time when you were living for Jesus. When you were shining the light and influencing those around you. It may be because you've never really given your life to Christ. You don't have the kingdom attributes because you are not a citizen of the kingdom yet. Could that be the case for you today? If it is, I want to just invite you this morning, right where you're at. Nobody around you is looking. All of our heads are bowed. All of our eyes are closed. Would you right where you're at, take a moment and call out to God, just between you and him, in your heart, in your mind, speak to God this morning. And ask him to come into your heart and forgive your sins. And give your life to him today. It doesn't matter what, what words you use. It really matters your heart expressing a desire to have Jesus come into your life and forgive your sins. That's what he died on the cross for. And make a difference in your life. To change you from the inside out. This morning, I want to encourage you to pray right now, right where you're at. That God would save you once and for all. here today that would be so bold to stick out just for a second. If, this, if today's your day, today's the day you've asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. I wonder if you wouldn't mind, just between you and I, just to slide up a hand just so I can see. If that's you, just slide up a hand if you prayed today to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. know about it just because I want to pray for you. I won't call you out or embarrass you. Just between you and me. Slide a hand up so I can see. And, you know, for Christians this morning, I want to say this. You know, maybe there's an area of your life that your walk with Jesus hasn't touched. Maybe Jesus has your, your church life. And maybe he even has your home life, but does he have your work life? Does he have your hobbies? It's his influence in those areas. Or there are some areas of decay in your life that the influence of Jesus in you and through you needs to touch. Would you surrender those this morning to him? Here in just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. We invite you to respond. 
If God has laid on your heart this morning, you need to be saved and you've answered him and given your life to Christ, would you come forward in just a moment and make that public and we'll schedule a baptism. We'll get some things going for you and we'd be so excited to celebrate that with you this morning. Uh, Maybe it's baptism. Maybe you've uh, been saved. There's a step you've missed here. You haven't followed through with believer's baptism yet. We want to talk to you about that and get that scheduled for you and talk to you about that. We'd be real excited. So if you've given your life to Christ but not followed through with baptism, would you come in just a moment? Maybe you're not sure if you've given your life to Christ. I'd love to talk to you about that. Maybe it's church membership. You've been here. You've been visiting. It's time you put down roots, so to speak. Made it official. And become a member of First Baptist Church. Would you do that this morning? As we stand, as we stand, you come. Stand with me this morning. And if you need to do business with God, you come forward and make it happen. Be bold. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. mountains yes and your justice flows like the ocean tides and I will leave my voice to worship you my King and I will find my Be seated for just a moment. Be seated. Let me tell you about uh, something's happening next Sunday, right quick. Next Sunday, uh, there is a lunch after church, a fundraiser lunch for our youth group for Falls Creek, which is our church camp. Uh, There's some of them excited about that. All right. It's an Indian taco lunch, which will be delicious. We, We have had those historically here. They're really good. We'll also have a dessert auction as well. Uh, at that lunch. So uh, come and support our, our youth group in that effort. Bring your friends and, and we'll give and that way we'll, we'll kind of ease that burden so more of those kids are able to go to church camp. Uh, we know the impact that Falls Creek and church camp has on young lives. It's really big and really important. So we want to give as, as many kids the opportunity as we can to get to that. They can raise some money to be able to go to that. So next Sunday, come for lunch. All right. Everybody remember that? We're planning on about 200, okay, over here, so y'all don't let me down. That was not a joke. We're planning for 200, all right? So come to that. Also, ladies' Bible study is uh, tonight. I think they, they kind of kicked off last week and really get into the, to the study tonight. Uh, I heard that the lady that's kind of leading that up is really cute, so y'all should come to that. 
It's my wife. That's why I say that, just to clarify. All right, y'all can still join that. You can still come tonight, and that's at 4.30 over here in the Fellowship Hall. Got a couple to present this morning. Uh, this is John and Megan Slinkard. Would y'all come? And they come this morning um, having received Jesus as their, their Lord and Savior already, but wishing to be baptized and unite with our church in church membership. So we're excited about that. Aren't we excited? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So be sure and, uh, and welcome them, and we'll be scheduling their baptism here uh, coming up soon. And we always look forward to those opportunities we get to baptize a husband and wife at the same time. That's kind of special. We like that. So praise God for that. So be sure and welcome them, get to know them, and, and make sure they're encouraged here at First Baptist Church. Let me close this in a word of prayer, and then we will be dismissed for today. God, we love you. We thank you, Father, for the time we've had to worship you. For the songs we got to sing, the time we got to sing together. Father, I thank you that the ice was able to, to melt away and the roads were clear that we could get here. And I pray and I thank you for those people that are here today for the very first time. Or God, they're back. They haven't been here in a while, but they're back, Father. I thank you for that. Would you reward them? Would you encourage them? They keep coming. We want them, Lord. Thank you for bringing them here. We thank you for John and Megan who've come to join our church. They say this is the place that you have for us, that you want us to be at. We thank you that you would draw people here. I pray we'd go out with us today as we leave. Would you stay fresh on our hearts and minds and draw us back here on Wednesday night for Bible study and, and fellowship meal and back next Sunday morning as well. We love you, Lord, and pray in your wonderful name. Amen.